The following is part of Cornell Contemporary China Initiative Lecture Series under the Cornell East Asia Program. The arguments and viewpoints of this talk belong solely to the speaker. We hope you enjoy. Okay, uh, I think it's time to start. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Cornell Contemporary China Initiative Lecture Series. My name is Mario Du, and I'm assistant professor teaching more than China at the history department here at Cornell University. Um, I'm serving as the director of the CCCI series in the spring semester with, with this theme, In General China. <coughs> Founded in 2015, this lecture series has brought hundreds of leading scholars of China from multiple di disciplines uh, to share their cutting edge research with Cornell students, faculty, and the general public. This series is sponsored by the East Asia program, and here I would also like to express my sincere gratitude to our co-sponsors, the Department of Asian Studies, Cornell Center for Social Sciences, the Feminist, Gender, and Sexuality Studies program, the Department of History, IRR School's Global Labor Institute, the Levinson China and the Asia Pacific Studies program, and the Cornell Society for the Humanities. It's a great honor for me to introduce the first speaker of the spring 2023 uh, CCCI series, Professor Lin Ma. Professor Ma received her PhD in history from the University at Buffalo in 2016. She's currently an assistant professor of history at the State University of New York at Genesel. Professor Ma has published multiple peer-reviewed articles on gender, law, and reproduction in early 20th century China. She's currently working on a book manuscript entitled Mortal Labor, Abortion, Childbirth, and Reproduction, uh, Reproductive Diet in Early 20th Century China. She is also preparing for her second book project on the power of tears and the politics of laughter in modern China. Today, Professor Ma is going to give a talk entitled Men, Masculinity, and Childbirth in Early 20th Century China, which is part of her current book project. Since spring 2022, the CCCS series has been held both in person on campus and broadcasted online via Zoom, thanks to the help and expertise provided by our incredible East Asia program event coordinator, Ms. Amala Lin. Uh, to those who are attending the lecture via Zoom today, please type your questions and comments into the chat box anytime during the lecture or during the Q&A session. We will cover them during the Q&A session with the speaker following her lecture. The recording of this lecture will be made available online following the lecture. Please feel free to share, share the video with your colleagues, classmates, and friends if they cannot make it today due to schedule conflict. Now let us give a warm applause to welcome Professor Ma. The floor and the screen are it will be mine for one hour. Okay, <laughs> um, okay. everyone, um, really my honor to be here. And this is uh, some of my uh, new research from the book manuscript. And I haven't presented this part of my research at all. So you will have, I will have the privilege to test them on you, right, in many ways and share with you. Um, okay, my one hour starts now and I will get started, okay? Um, <clears throat> how were ordinary men historically involved in events such as birth? Child, childbirth and abortion, and how and why did their involvement change over time? And what can the length of everyday reproduction tell us about the moving fault lines of masculinity? And how do we answer those questions with the help of what kinds of sources? These are some of the questions central to my talk today. It has been my observation that historians of reproduction um, have long placed the woman and the female body at the center of inquiries about pregnancy, childbirth, and uh, abortion, as well as um, maternal deaths and health. Such narratives often focus on women's negotiation with patriarchal demands, collective interests, gender norms, as well as reproductive technologies and politics. They do recognize that men's also there. Men, men did um, have input in it, but usually in men's public and the professional roles as theorists, reformers, doctors, policymakers who commanded institutions like childbirth and the maternal care um, from a privileged and distant position. 
rarely did men come to us as gendered everyday agents, as flawed, confused, or caring partners and fathers. Those personal and or public lives could be deeply intertwined with seemingly feminine reproductive events. So this presents, uh, didn't change this slide for some reason. Oh, we'll try again. Mm -hmm. Oh, maybe it's okay. Here, it's better. Okay, okay, now it's better. The mouse was not there. Sorry for the little um, accident. Yeah. Oh, I got back. Okay, now this presentation makes a uh, deliberate intervention by exploring childbirth and labor pains as a history and his voice. I argue that childbirth served as a key site for defining and differentiating masculinity and male identity in late 19th century and early 20th century China. And individual fathers and partners, far from being uniformly absent or aloof, demonstrated a varied enthusiasm and attitudes uh, and performed a diversity of responsibilities and roles during times of reproductive crisis. So that's one of my arguments. Um, by highlighting the vibrancy and plurality of gender innovations and masculine performances surrounding childbirth during this critical period of Chinese history, I hope to enrich our understanding of the recent Chinese past and hearten us with a wider range of analytical lenses and masculine precedents. It's also my intention to steer the literature on abortion away from the overemphasized and try to focus on nation population. What I will do in the following is place men, masculinity, and gender at the center of everyday realities of childbearing uh, during this time. I'll offer many examples for you and uh, a preliminary taxonomy of male engagement. But of course, my examples will be selective and I will eschew the better known discourses, roles, and expressions, and the foreground praxis, as well as those more obscure and the more thought-provoking thought interests and expressions. Um, is the sound effect okay, everyone? Is a, a, okay. Um, okay, now let's move on to um, some stories. Okay, I'll give you examples. Orthodox moralists in 19th century China may have reiterated the opinion of medical and moral classics uh, from longer ago, insisting that feminine and ritual polluting matters such as menstruation, pregnancy, and childbirth were subjects inappropriate for open scrutiny, and that they should uh, take place and be quietly handled in secluded women's quarters, insulated from the male gaze and the uh, disease-causing wind. But at least by the late 19th century, such rules, I argue, uh, were frequently breached, not only under the nose of elite men, but sometimes catered precisely to their gratification. The newly emergent commercial newspapers, they're truly exciting. Uh, for example, encouraged and preserved a playful, casual, and erotic, sometimes, male elite interaction with purported women's business. And this was a novel interest and experience quite dissimilar from those captured in well-explored genres, such as medical treatises and uh, policy recommendations. So as the following uh, examples will demonstrate, what these late scene testimonies shared in common was an engagement of a predominantly male authorship and readership with the so-called maternity matters, with a high level of social immediacy, graphic details, mundane scenes, and the irreverence for author orthodox proprieties and gender boundaries. They suggested an ongoing erosion and loosening of mainstream restrictions that aim to both protect and confine the masculine. The masculine. Okay, so we're going to talk about the, the slides, the pictures shown on the slides. For example, a highly visualized theme emerging in the nascent new uh, news media concerned the occurrence of roadside childbirth. A new, uh, a new story ca uh, carried by the popular De Shijai pictorial in 1885, for example, graphically illustrates Thanks to the new introduction of lithography technology in printing, details of a birth labor scene that allegedly occurred on a busy street in the city of Yangzhou. 
typical of the format and style of late scene pictorial report, reportage. The new story, as we can see, right, including two parts, uh, a written narrative and also the visual part. As we can see, the visual that dominates the news page presents a large and a growing crowd of spectators gathering around a newborn and a fully dressed woman who sits on the side of the street facing away from the news media, the news reader, and the majority of the crowd, right? Also us. The onlookers are rendered as predominantly male and who's closing, if you look carefully to the, you know, to the right close-up version one, and the facial hair, posture, accessories. And then we can tell yeah, they suggest um, um, an assortment of male types varying in age, education, occupation. The only female onlooker is portrayed as a married woman or nursemaid carrying a small child who is stealing a frontal view of the birthing woman. In contrast to the vivid portrayal of the crown and the physical environment, directed depictions of the nude female body, private body parts, or bloody by byproducts of the labor were actually as true, right, as we can tell. The skilled commercial illustrator Wu Lu likely found an overly sexual and realistic approach artistically unappealing and therefore as true that's my one of my theories. But anyway, instead, the artist preferred to titillate the reader's imagination by providing subtle visual cues and the suspenseful concealments. Uh, for example, the reader's restricted view of the birthing woman is compensated by an open view of the onlookers' varied facial expressions and the body language, whom are shown staring, peeking, or whispering from various angles while perhaps reacting to the smell, sight, and sound of the person scene. Standing right next to the exposed parturient, some particularly bold and nosy onlookers, as we can tell, they were um, including both the scholarly um, scholar and the labor looking man are shown hunching over for careful scrutiny of the, you know, the woman and the baby. Carefully mobilized visual details, such as the woman's unkempt, unkempt long hair and uncovered forearm, which should otherwise be neatly arranged in this period for respectful women, remind the reader of the spectacle's sexual undertone. The pithy but evocative caption further views the excitement and or sympathy by suggesting that the woman's entire labor is laid bare to onlookers. The caption reads, the parturian started to moan and groan abruptly and after a long time delivered a girl whom she hastily wrapped in her own skirt. Right. And I'm going to show you another example. Oh, here, um, we should click off this one, okay. And here, this one, okay. It's a little, how about here? Another pictorial news story published in 1909 represented the appearance of a curbside childbirth during a Lenten festival, which as the caption states, attracted a large influx of men and women to the prefectural town. Again, Orthodox Confucian moral and the medical advisors would undoubtedly consider the congestion, noise, and mixing up the sexes inappropriate and unhealthy for respectful women, especially when they're expecting. But it is also well known in China that festivals and fairs have a very strong uh, appeal to women, especially women who are expecting because, you know, they're looking for, hoping for fertility, for safe delivery, for the birth of a son and so forth. Um, uh, th those can all be attractions. As a new story testified, a group of women at varying ages, including a pregnant woman, accompanied each other to the festival. When the pregnant woman unexpectedly came in labor outside of strangers' residence, as the caption relates, her traveling companions midwifed her and formed a circle around her to offer the privacy and the protection she needed. As soon as the umbilical cord was severed, the reporter didn't detail how that was achieved on the roadside, and the newborn was swaddled. These women hired a carrier and escorted the pregnant woman home. Having a group of resourceful and caring female friends, fending and advocating for her, this pregnant woman would be envied by the lone Yangzhou woman in the first news story. But both women have to cope with the ubiquitous male gaze and pride. In the second case, illustrator used the three male figures to represent the possible onlookers gathering at the labor scene. They're stopped steps away from the parturient and the new, newborn 
by the firm stares of the protective woman who outnumbered them. But the male onlookers' curiosity is clearly not easily thwarted as the fixation of their gaze betrays. Lijo references to sexuality and the maternal body were again kept subtle but palpable. While details of the young mother and newborn's frontal features are visible, they're not represented in a disheveled condition. Instead, the artist made use of small signs such as bolded legs, exhausted body posture, pointed bound feet, and the squatting posture, which was the recommended delivery position in this period to subtly allude to the intimate process of labor, um, the labor process omitted by the artist here. A variety of male voices and the commentaries uh, accompanied the actual and imagined open gaze passed at the roadside birthing woman. The first news stories written narratives, for example, underscored the biological and economic burden endured by the female sex and lower class families. In a uh, very sympathetic and compassionate voice, the reporter presented Yangzhou women's outdoor labor as a poignant reminder of the unfortunate and the seemingly inevitable fate of lower class women in general, recognizing that sex and reproduction disproportionately burden women. The reporter lamented that, quote, women's ordeal was 10 times more bitter than that of men, especially considering the precarious nature of childbirth. And the reporter finds young women particularly pitiful because, quote, even eminent families who meticulously prepare for deliveries cannot guarantee safe outcomes, not to mention humble families who cannot afford to ensure their pregnant, pregnant woman an ideal environment. Mindful of ingrained sexual and economic inequalities, the reporter placed no blame, quite remarkably in this period, right? No blame on uh, the less than ideal behavior of the pregnant individual who, quote, has to roam the street to eke a living despite her approaching due date. In comparison, the narrator of the other news story didn't show as this kind of noble compassion for women in general or the working class. A tone of mild derision and disapproval lurked beneath uh, the descriptive service. Instead of applauding female solidarity in a time of emergency, the reporter underscored women's embarrassment by describing comically how they fled the scene in a fluster. In this context, the untimely childbirth reads like a punishment for reckless women who set themselves up for humiliation and danger when they could afford a seclusion. Here, the male voice almost added um, a, a layer of righteous sneer to the visualized male gaze. Interestingly, interestingly in fact, neither story's written narratives even um, explicitly acknowledged the existence of any onlookers at the scenes. Right? They actually didn't talk about onlookers. In, a, in addition, it is no, 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 uh, noteworthy that other than superficial references to groaning and moaning, both reports included a very few empirical details about the physiology or midwife rate involved in the process of childbirth. But the fact that labor or postpartum scenes and the predominantly male onlookers were uh, portrayed with such a vigor, I contend, reflected at the very least an in immense, intense male interest in reproductive events, as well as in the mingling of the sexes during such events. Such news reports, many of which were equally graphic, though not always involving actual drawings, also signified a shrinking distance, though still very distant, between men and the, these purported women exclusive events. Finch's storytelling. Um, also, well, mouse moved. Um, also, sorry, here, okay. Also um, uh, constituted a popular conduit for elite male expression or elite male gossip in the late scene period. Um, and uh, uh, they often, um, this genre often used the supernatural or karmic events as their main plot device and the fantastic and supernatural elements were often blended with mundane social uh, details and scenarios. 
um, in ways similar to the phenomenon of internet memes in current day digital culture, authorship appeared unimportant for those participating in this kind of culture of uh, tidbits, storytelling, and the highly identical plot lines were very common, tolerated, and even sometimes expected. Indeed, imitation and subtle modification appear to be a key feature and perhaps an attraction of this type of networked social and literary games. It is not uncommon to find strange stories about childbearing and childbirth in these casual sketches. Okay, they're particularly useful, in my opinion, for revealing certain aspects of contemporaneous male knowledge and uh, anxieties um, and desires regarding to um, reproduction, gender, sexuality, and social order. Um, these moralistic, padro, and or comical narratives shared a few recurrent plot templates and the social marital settings. Remote control of my screen approved. Okay, um, so for this one, uh, deny this one. Okay. Um, okay. So they shared a few templates. That's where we left off. For example, events are often set in a elite polygamous household where the jealous wife abuses the concubines and mates and deceives the um, aloof, her aloof husband who's either a rich merchant or from a merchant background, uh, gentry background. Childbearing and childbirths are represented as both. Um, um, as both uh, a kind of uh, major battlefield and a key weapon that can be deployed to subvert or restore domestic and gender orders. Occurrences of female infertility, difficult labor, maternal mortality, miscarriage, induced abortion, they all show up in this kind of stories. And they're often presented as sources of tension and discord, as well as manifestations of divine justice. Along with a cunning and ruthless wife, another favorite character in this kind of story is the midwife, abortionist. Okay, um, and uh, I will talk about, I will give you guys a few examples of that kind of plot lines and stories. Okay, and then first example is um, uh, the story, a story published in 1878, and it's very representative. Titled Tidbits from Suzhou, this short piece is about a um, hundred characters in length, so very short and is packed with action and a dramatic twists. At the center of the story is the cruel and manipulative wife's self-inflicted demise. The uh, unnamed protagonist is the wife of a middle-aged man and the daughter of a wealthy family, whose husband badly wants an heir, but the wife seems unable to conceive, understanding that she must act as a generous and considerate wife under such circumstances. The protagonist encourages her husband to take a concubine, but she secretly she secretly drugs the concubine with a purported abortive fastened as soon as the concubine becomes pregnant, and which kills the concubine. Instead of re repenting or being punished, the wife goes on to acquire a maid for her husband, whom she abuses daily. Apparently, the wife's plan is to force the pregnant maid to flee, hire an old woman to shelter the runaway, and seize the child born by the midwife as her own once the maid gives birth. So it's quite crazy, the plot, right? Very sinister. And she almost gets her way again when the un unexpected occurrence uh, interrupted her intricate plan. And the story goes, the childless wife suddenly becomes pregnant when she awaits to claim the maid's child. And then we wonder, right, naturally, why does the bad woman not only get unpunished, but also gets rewarded? When the reader has every reason to question the fairness of karma by this point, the wife starts to suffer severe pain in the stomach, which, quote, no doctor can alleviate, unquote. With a turn of fortune full of irony, the wife becomes so sick that she decides to end her pregnancy by taking the very abortive fashion that she has used on the other woman. In the end, she bleeds to death. Upon her death, the maids give birth to a child, uh, a boy, uh, and the old woman confesses everything to the husband and the maid and her, her son are restored to the family, right? So it's a good ending. 
And in a sense, this was an exciting but very cliched story. It parodies the rich, the jealous, the willful, all of which threatened the ideal gender and the class order envisioned by the Confucian gentleman patriarch, and all of which had been condemned for many, many centuries, right? So it was didactic and cautionary with this clear narrative closure, the ending, patriarchal interests were safeguarded and the bad were punished and uh, by the same fate that she forced on other people and invoking popular Buddhist views of justice, it underscored that karmic retribution could be delayed, but you know you will get punished right when it's time. Um, so that's the kind of familiar side of the story. But the story, in my opinion, appears a lot more interesting when we put aside the plot and the key didactic messages and bring male agency and reproductive reality into focus. Contrary to the oblivious and the passive male character in the story, the predominantly male producers and consumers of these stories, in fact, I argue, demonstrate a significant knowledge about childbearing and childbirth in daily settings. This story, for example, relatively realistically captured the dangerous effects of certain contemporary abortifacents. It took good note of fertility and the infertility's psychological and the social impact on women and paid attention to the occurrence of severe illnesses during or associated with pregnancy. It underscored the fact that fertility and motherhood were not always pleasant or universally desired Rather, death and complications often lurked closely. And aside from factors such as adultery or poverty, mental and physical distress during pregnancy could also cause a woman to resort to abortion. In addition, the story rightfully noted that female reproductive labor was valuable and marketable, but also exploitable and disposable. It didn't, sh it didn't shun from the fact that contemporary reproductive medicine was far from satisfactory, and that a diversity of moral and supernatural theories had to be enlisted oftentimes to explain the perplexing ways that reproduction worked, like why people get pregnant, why people die from pregnancy, and so forth. Even for better to do families, as the story suggested, childbearing and childbirth could still go wrong in so many ways. And these, um, as my other parts of my research uh, corroborated were actually very realistic, right? Even though it's a fict fictitious story. The precariousness, I, I want to give you guys another example. The pre precarious nature of reproduction and the shadow of death fear and the karmic law was further elaborated in an 1883 story that shared a very similar plot, a very similar to the previous story, the cunning and wicked wife also suddenly becomes pregnant after committing all those crimes we have described. And the long sought pre pregnancy again, turns out to be a curse and a penalty for the villain wife. But unlike the earlier story, uh, the wife's initial joy of pregnancy is cut short by the return of the dead concubine's vengeful ghost who exposes the wife's crimes and hypocrisy in front of the whole family and announces that the pregnancy is her vengeance approved by a high God. From that point on, the wife is described as being tor tormented by the ghost and her prophecy. And the wife tries to end her pregnancy with abortifacent drugs, but of no avail. She tries to end her own life, but getting nowhere, she couldn't even kill herself, right? And then Buddhist monks are invited and the money's wasted in an effort to appease and exorcise the ghost eventually. The anguished wife has to face the final mystery, which is her difficult and protracted and deadly labor, uh, which lasted, quote, for three days and causes all kinds of horrors too painful to recount, unquote. Again, if we view the story through the lens of men made and men consumed the dramas of reproduction, beneath the theatrical moral coating, we find the acknowledgement of a, a, vari a wide variety of common sufferings and crises relating to reproduction in this period. For example, the concubine, who is the daughter of a peasant family, is said to have died from the so-called blood coma, a frequently mentioned symptom, perhaps akin to puberal infection, 
um, during uh, postpartum. And the wife dies from difficult labor, a largely fatal situation in the medical context of late 19th century China, which almost guaranteed the severe injuries or, uh, or death on the mother, for the mother or child. And the experiences of the character also attest to and reinforce the stigma and the horror attached to um, what I'm showing on the screen, uh, maternal uh, mortality in folk beliefs and the popular religions. According to some of these beliefs, all menstruating women and those dying from childbearing and childbirth in particular would be doomed to the so-called blood pond hell unless special rituals, special rituals were sponsored by filial children to redeem the women. In other words, the story's dramatic effect, I argue, was achieved through a shared and reinforced familiarity of the author and reader with everyday reproductive problems. Even though these problems were presented as affecting prim primarily women, it is important to bear in mind that it was these invisible men who had considerable empirical knowledge and interest about childbearing who fantasized and feminized reproduction. The same pattern is evident in stories centering on the fault and fate of the midwife. In, the, in this period, uneducated lay midwives had almost exclusive access to the parturient and the hands-on segment of obstetric market in China. Her success, her lower class background, and her popular image as an older menopausal woman made her a popular target for ridicule and offered the gentleman gangsters a perfect opportunity to show off their command of satire, irony, and sometimes body humor. So the 1883 story we just discussed only mentioned the role of midwife in passing, who as the wife's accomplice ends up dying from uh, unstoppable diarrhea. <laughs> That's how, how mean the, the, the story was. A plot detail likely chosen for um, the symptoms, partial resemblance to emergency uterine bleeding. That's my interpretation during or after labor. Um, other stories enlarged on this theme with more and sometimes more horrifying details. For example, a caustic uh, anecdote published in Shenbao in 1877 tells the story of a well-to-do midwife uh, whose abdomen starts to bulge, quote, like a pregnant woman. So this is an older, older lady, right? Older woman. After being bitten by a dog. And the physicians are invited, but to no avail. What's worse, the midwife starts to suffer from great, um, great pain in her stomach, which is accompanied by soft barking from inside her, her belly. The midwife, however, dismisses the possibility of her being impregnated by a dog. As the narrator explains, the, the midwife is confident that she knows everything about reproduction because, quote, she's a woman herself and an expert on maternal matters, uh, unquote. But the midwife's perception of reality is crushed in no time by the author of the story, right? Unable to bear the pain, she asked her daughter-in-law to bring her a secretive drug. Um, that she has carefully locked away in, at home. After taking the medicine, the midwife discharges, quote, five puppies, unquote, right away. But her internal organs also begin to pour out, as the story relates. And then it's described in gory detail that bearable pain drives the midwife to gnaw on her own hands, maiming every single finger. Right before her death, the old woman ordered her uh, daughter-in-law to get away to discard the drug she has taken. The story ends with the dying woman's confession and repentance, who enjoins her daughter-in-law not to repeat her mistake and her damned fate, even though the drug and the body fastened has helped the, fa the family become very rich. Such stories certainly fit in the context of the well-documented local and worldwide marginalization of uneducated uh, midwives and other lower-class handy women in the process of professionalization and uh, state building. The authors of our story clearly contributed to this tradition with uh, a, a tradition of vilification with some humor, uh, bad humor and uh, ingenuity, right? Uh, but beneath this strange, exaggerated and stereotypical narrative service, the elite male narrator readers quite nuanced grip 
on the social and practical, practical details of reproduction is also discernible. For example, the seemingly casual placement of the daughter-in-law in the story as a key character um, well captured the historical fact that midwife skills in this period were often transmitted within the family from the mother-in-law to the daughter-in-law. More um, also, it can be argued that uh, the story's depiction of dislocated and, and expelled internal organs was not merely just any horrifying embellishment, but was grounded in the author's awareness that prolapsed vagina, bladder, and the rectum, as well as invasion of other organs or secretion into the birth canal were um, but some of the very common damage that repeated or difficult vaginal deliveries left on the female body in this period. So basically everyone audience. Mm -hmm. So the C-section, for example, was not available during this period, right? So the main form of delivery labor is vaginal delivery. And so a lot of damage can basically be caused onto the vagina, right? So uh, that's what I'm talking about here. Okay, move on. In addition, the detail about the hand gnawing wife, um, the, the hand gnawing midwife is really interesting. Um, and I argue that that was also perhaps chosen deliberately as an object of self mutilation. So instead of pinching your thigh, for example, stabbing the side, why gnawing on the hand, right? Um, so because they were, um, oh, not here, okay. Because they were tabooed and uh, laden with meanings, folk views in this period and even later, uh, even later, found the hands of the midwife particularly offensive and ill fated. They were viewed as an embodiment of the dis, uh, of debased occupation for their frequent contact with reproductive organs, ritually polluting fluids as well as afterbirth and dead bodies. For example, in some contemporaneous Chinese communities, it was believed that the hands of a deceased midwife must be gloved, covered up before she was buried. Um, so the the rationale is that um, because eventually she will go to the blood on the hell as well. And uh, and then, so to uh, perhaps the, the gloves were used to, to conceal the dead woman's former occupation by concealing her ritually stained hands so that she would not be spotted and punished with extra severity by the judges of the underworld. So the scene of the midwife's self-mutilation clearly reflected the author's ability, um, as I argue, to concoct or make justice and horror with high precision. With these facts and details in mind, I, I ask, can we posit that the elite male author and reader had acquired a considerable empirical knowledge about these reproductive wounds, complaints, and the fears? Was it possible that they obtained this level of practical knowledge by living and communicating with their partners and female relatives? or even by participating in deliveries in person. At the very least, these men didn't consider themselves unmasculine for being able to craft and understand detailed anecdotes about the seemingly feminine and domestic matters. Um, so granted, these stories were often couched in moralistic or sexual languages, which were conventional masculine territories. But I hope to demonstrate under the shell of conventional masculine discourses, considerable fresh and realistic empirical substance also existed. And this could of course be read as a manifestation of expanding male control. But I think there was also genuine interest to collaborate, to learn and to transgress the orthodox gender and the reproductive boundaries. And evidence of male partners accompanying the parturient during her labor would actually become much more plentiful in China in the 1930s and 40s. And I have written about that in some other occasions. Uh, but even for this earlier period, it is possible to posit that Chinese men may have been more involved in this kind of assuming polluting and feminine events more so than we previously assumed. Okay, and then we move on to the next section. So indeed, the late scene male condemnation and the ridicule targeting the main wife, the midwife, and the mother-in-law um, 
signified an elite male resentment at unwanted interference in their intimate relationships and a desire for a truly personal, personal life. Their frustration and longing didn't stop at discourses. Um, their involvement uh, appeared particularly pronounced and crucial when there was a strong possibility that a pregnancy or labor would go wrong or when they actually went wrong. As we have touched on previously, worries about pregnancy, labor, perinatal safety were real and well-founded. Childbearing and childbirth remained highly precarious whenever physiological condition deviated from the most usual normal and are complicated. Uneducated lay, um, lay midwives had been in charge of normal vaginal deliveries in China, and they have done so reasonably well when the, child, when the labor was normal. But this class of caregivers uh, was overall unprepared to, for detecting and addressing emergencies. For example, you have twins. For example, the position, the presentation is not normal, then they have trouble. Um, and so uh, later on in the Republican period, there was more um, substantial improvements in advanced midwifery and obstetrical care in China. But still overall, it was gradual, the improvement and the socially regionally uneven during this period. Also globally speaking, fetal imaging technologies and the development of mass and the mass production of antibiotics still awaited breakthroughs. So really um, in general, before uh, World War II, overall childbirths are, were much, much more dangerous and a lot of people died from childbirth. All of these factors limited childbirths for the majority of Chinese in this period to at-home vaginal deliveries attended by midwives, lay midwives, without prenatal examinations. Some educated urbanites and those with means were increasingly supplementing this birthing model with advanced care and interventions such as obstetrical C-section, forceps, craniotomy, um, et cetera, offered by professional obstetricians and the modern schooled midwives either at home or in the hospital. They nonetheless remained the privileged, privileged minority. And even these advanced interventions still came with high risk uh, in this period, such as cross infection and other, other issues. Um, so all in all, the point is that maternity and childbearing, childbirth remained very dangerous and unpredictable for mo most Chinese in this period. The occurrence of abnormal fetal placenta presentations, a multiple birth, the and the premature incomplete or failed separation of the placenta from the wall of the uterus, which basically will cause unstoppable bleeding during uh, delivery, all of these uh, among other complications, it could lead to the sudden loss of one or more lives for a family. So there's a lot stake at uh, childbirth during this period. In a time when family limitation also was technologically challenging and the frequent childbearing and childbirth were a beauty in reality for most women and men, the specter of reproductive death and its impact on everyday life, I argue, must, must not be underestimated. Um, so therefore, male members, uh, fellow members' actions and emotions must also be understood against this overall uh, context. Um, as we know, oftentimes when we think about people praying, right, especially if, like, praying for a safe delivery, we often think of women praying for themselves or praying for other women. But some men actually also did precisely so uh, in the leasing period. A public uh, and the Republican period. A public announcement posted in Shenbao in 1890, for example, captured the moving wish of a 12 year old boy named Liu Ho An, who donated to a relief effort um, in the hopes of accumulating good karma to ensure his mother's safe delivery. Similarly, a man named Bao Huiqing vowed in 1918 that he would donate 50 silver dollars a quite substantial amount to a famous charity that specialized at rescuing kidnapped women and children should his daughter-in-law deliver safely. And uh, we also know that wishes and vows were made by men from a much more humble, modest uh, background as well. Uh, on, one, on the same donation slip, 
along with a 12-year-old boy, an anonymous man was recorded to have donated five silver dollars for the longevity and the safe labor of his mother. And I believe a systematic combing of charity records will bring to light more actions of similar uh, nature. So I don't think it's, it's really uh, exceptional. Um, when complications, death, and disputes occur, some husbands and uh, male relatives appeared to have played crucial roles in advocating on behalf of the parturient. Such support was particularly important for the birthing woman in the context of late uh, 19th and early 20th century China for a few reasons. On the one hand, the parturient and her family were faced with a medical field and market in major flux. The medical market in this period was really easy to enter and uh, therefore furiously competitive and confusing. No qualifying examinations, licensing, or diplomas existed or were re required. And technically, everyone could practice medicine. The unregulated situation started to change uh, during the first years of the 20th century, but the political and institutional instability characteristic of this period limited the efficacy of these regu regulatory efforts. The chaos was also an epist epistemological one. The sudden influx of diverse biomedical ideas, practices, and institutions within a few decades around the turn of the century, as well as their melding and colliding with existing norms, created both excitement and confusion. Medical disputes frequently arose because patients and practitioners had vastly different understandings about the cause of a complication or disease or the appropriate treatment needed for, for a patient. The fact that authoritative standards of care were either in short supply or not well received further complicated clinical encounters. As a result, it, when it came to healthcare, including maternity care, uh, patients and their family members often felt that uh, they had a personal responsibility to be particularly vigilant so as to keep charlatans and uh, profiteers at bay. Certainly, from the perspective of many um, bona fide medical practitioners, they could feel that it was the family of the birthing woman who were ignorant and profiteering, right? That's a perspective issue. In this context, we find many male partners and the family members at least tried to be attentive, vigilant, and protective, even though their interventions could appear ineffective, belated, or misplaced. For example, as reported by a major Chinese daily in 1920, labor complications occurred during a home delivery in a suburban village nearby Shanghai. The labor went on for two days and two nights. The fetus arm emerged first. And the late midwife at work tried everything, but couldn't push the hand back. And the report put it quite sympathetically to the midwife's predicament. Considering the parturient's dangerous condition, the midwife decided to dismember the fetus to ease the delivery. Don't be scared by dismembering. That was a common practice, actually. Even professional, well-trained um, um, obstetricians had to resort during this period as well, and globally. Okay, not only in China, but the midwife's method appeared crude and reckless, who, quote, severed the arm with a forceful, forceful pull, unquote. The parturient was said to have collapsed and died right away. The report didn't describe the husband's involvement during the labor, but highlighted his reaction after the death, tragic death. Saddened and outraged, the husband punched the midwife and dragged her to a nearby river to drown together, crying that he could live no more and that the midwife must pay a life for a life. The husband was stopped by other villagers with whose mediation the husband decided not to report this midwife to the police, but to settle privately. To atone for her fault, the midwife pledged to help the village build a, a bridge by, um, by offering donations, who also agreed to co-tell 20 times to the dead woman in front of the whole community and swear to heaven that he would never harm anybody anymore or practice midwifery, right? That's how they settled this, this event. 
In a medical dispute reported in 1931, another working class husband who was a boatman lost his wife due to labor complications. The wife was in her early 30s and already a mother of three children. A similar limb, uh, limb presentation, meaning hands coming down first, uh, also occurred in labor, which the lay midwives engaged, uh, engaged by the family couldn't handle. The husband sent his wife to a hospital for rescue and paid a dear sum equivalent to two or three times of his monthly income. Doctors at the hospital managed to extract the dead child through the birth canal. Um, heavy bleeding was reported to have occurred during, um, to, um, during, during this process. And uh, after the delivery and the labor, the parturient, the woman died um, a day later. The husband was enraged, not only for losing two family members within a few days, but also because the death of his wife took place when he was away from the hospital, as the hospital required him to, because, it, you know, off hour, you need to go. And then he was not expecting hospital should do that. And he brought the matter to the court, testified at an investigative hearing, and permitted a forensic autopsy to be done on his wife. Even though the prosecutor found the hospital not guilty, the husband's active involvement in this entire event was uh, unmistaken, uh, unmistakable, in my opinion. A tentative man not only had to stay on guard against um, hired medical practitioners, but sometimes also need to protect the parturient from dangers and pressure from within the family. And this was the case because a lot of women didn't have job in this period or they had jobs, but their income were not under their solely control. And therefore, um, sometimes you, can, you cannot yourself decide which doctor you want to go to and when you go to, uh, to use what medical uh, means. And therefore, in this context, usually uh, the mother-in-law traditionally had a lot of sway over this kind of decision. And then I argue, and not just I argue, but I discovered this from a lot of sources that uh, during this kind of condition, when a husband, if a husband can be involved, can be very proactive and uh, advocate for the parturient, and then things can be very different. And I have to skip the examples, but there are many examples of things went uh, good or bad because of their in, in, um, involvement. So the point is that male family members' participation in the sphere of childbirth perhaps varied widely, but as I argued, they were not always or uniformly marginal or absent from reproduct reproductive events. Um, and as we have seen, the labor and care associated with childbirth also didn't always end at the moment of delivery and limited itself to the birthing woman or the confines of the birth chamber. The after birth, dead children and deceased partners need to be buried and are mourned and the disputes need to be launched or settled, especially in the time when they frequently occurred. And men in this kind of context clearly played an important role in providing this kind of special perinatal care, I argue, right? So that's an argument. Uh, so now I would like to wrap up this talk with an unusual obituary authored by a husband, a Chinese husband in 1920s. Okay. So this obituary was published on the front pages, the front pages of a Shanghai-based newspaper called Republican Daily News, um, a major Chinese language newspaper well known in this in the heyday of the new culture and the May 4th years for its progressive editorials and uh, supplements. The announcement was posted uh, by um, a, a, a man by the name of uh, Xiao Wentai about the uh, upcoming funeral of his wife, Tu Yuying. Unlike the average public notice or editorial that one would find in a newspaper, common average newspaper in this period, uh, the obituary was exceptionally long. So the, this part is the obituary, right? And those are the other pages of the same newspaper. Um, as we can see, it's a very long, number one, and also almost covers, takes up uh, half of an entire news page. Besides a short and a standard notice about the funeral, the announcement included a lengthy biography about the deceased that includes 
about 2,400 characters and it was composed in elegant and terse classical prose. So meaning just a lot, really very long for, for Chinese classical prose, uh, Chinese prose. Instead of the vernacular style that became popular and increasingly embraced by progressive intellectuals in this period, right, when they write uh, something to publish on newspapers. Its archaic flavor was also manifested in its unpunctuated sentences. No punctuation is used to write entire the lines um, and arranged in vertical lines, each containing about 64 characters, right? So the, the point is, it's really hard to read on this. Um, and in, in comparison, most of the textual content in the same newspaper in this period was typeset for optimal read readability in punctuated lines. And, and each containing merely 20 characters. So it's not that punctuation is not invented, but he didn't use punctuation. In other words, the author seemed to have adopted a deliberate style and the formatting and style um, alone already lend the piece a striking visual prominence, seriousness, and boldness. It was not published, in other words, to hide. The elegant yet Old fashioned the classical prose proved apt for conveying a Republican Chinese man's intimate feelings and unconventional confessions. The genre of funerary writing by nature expected the omission of the unpleasant and the controversial and the right representation of the deceased along the lines of a moral paragon. So it's kind of similar to recommendation letters nowadays, right? You, you emphasize the good things. Um, but, and, but by the late, late Ming, private funerary writings increasingly challenged this generic and moral restriction by expressing open grief and affection for unconventional subjects, such as deceased conjugal partners or even infants, right? Uh, so, so it's already a tra new tradition is already coming up, but it remained rare and radical for the biographer to disclose potentially scandalous or even criminal occurrences within the family in an epitaph. So in the Republican period, abortion was criminalized, right? So this could be potentially criminal if you disclose some induced abortion occurred in your home. In this context, Xiao Wen Tai's commemoration of his wife reads particularly striking and unusual because it not only meticulously detailed his wife's death from an induced abortion, but also presented her choice as in harmony with her other feminine virtues. As a husband's poignant descriptions of his wife relates, so Tu Yiying was a native of Shaoxing, born into a scholarly family in the 1880s. Even in her um, earlier years, she demonstrated extraordinary perseverance, virtue, and ability as she lost one after another immediate family members, even before reaching 16. But she handled the devastation and uh, maintained her natal family in a fashion, quote, even an adult male couldn't compare, unquote. She not only mastered her natal, um, uh, sorry, mastered all the skills expected of a talented lady in the early modern Confucian context, but also briefly attended a new style women's schools and kept herself abreast of the spirit and learning of the late Qing and early Republican age. As a school educated wife, she also lived in harmony with her husband's extended family and supported her family, her husband's career and political activities, which frequently took him away from home and uh, like five years away from home, for example. She gave birth to five children, breastfed all of them and managed to raise four of them to school age. She lost one child, um, uh, one, di one died. She traditionally managed family finances, broke on herself, yet generous to those in need. All in all, the point is that Tu Yiying appeared as an outstanding model woman, whether measured by Confucian or Republican Chinese standard. Why did such a good mother and wise wife choose an abortion? How could her husband, how would her husband reconcile these facts? And how would the husband preserve her integrity and legacy? Right, that's something curious. In the main, Xiao Wen Tai justified his wife's decision to procure an induced abortion as a last resort to an insoluble recurring health issue that she endured over her six pregnancies and dreaded over her 15 years of miscarriage. 
as a husband explained, um, okay, where is it? As a husband explained, mm, right here, um, she um, furnishes vomiting occurred during every pregnancy, which progressively damaged the wife's health during her last pregnancy, quote, she vomited dozens of times every day, which perpetuated even when her stomach had nothing to bring up. As, she, as her husband admitted, even before the complications set in, the pre pregnant wife already considered the option of induced abortion at the onset of her last pregnancy and shared this thought with the husband. He allegedly advised her against abortion because, quote, Abortion is unnatural and it damage it will damage your health, unquote. But unable to take food, the wife became emaciated and on the verge of dying. The author implied that an induced abortion became a therapeutic necessity as the wife's condition deteriorated. And they consulted, and the wife pleaded with the, the doctors invited to help end her pregnancy or fix her pregnancy. But all the doctors invited said. Uh, shrugged basically their shoulder and said, we have no means, or so we were told by the husband. And then the induced abortion happened. Xiao Wentai euphemized and glossed over the occurrence of induced abortion as, quote, a sudden resumption of the menses, unquote, which came in a menacing fashion with, quote, large clots of blood rushing down, um, rushing down, unquote. The wife seemed to have been relieved and optim optimistically anticipating recovery. The husband, who was more cautious, noted closely that the, the patient's pulse became um, exceedingly weak and that she raved deliriously at night, all about mundane matters and everyday living. Sensing an ominous end was imminent, the husband called their children to return home from boarding school though the selfless wife still insisted that she was fine and worried instead about the children will be missing classes. But soon, quote, her eyes and tongue became sluggish, unquote, indicating the, the approaching death. The otherwise restrained husband broke down, overwhelmed by grief. He included in the biography the final conversation between the couple. When the husband asked his wife's wish and uh, will, the wife only mustered her last strength to comfort the husband, telling him once again, not to worry, not to grieve. Uh, I will be fine soon. When the husband confessed his sense of guilt for not being able to re reciprocate his, her sacrifice and love and asked for her forgiveness, she merely encouraged him to live on, to take care of himself. Surrounded by her children and husband, the wife, passed away at five o'clock on the afternoon of November the 4th, 1919, after 42 days of struggle. And I'm recounting these details because the husband meticulously recorded all these details and publicized them with the readers of the newspaper. For those expecting to find an iconoclastic attack on the gender inequalities embedded in the sexual, reproductive, and the medical system of the day, Xiao Wentai's commemoration and the confession seemed rather uncritical, stoic, and disappointing, while demonstrating and encouraging compassion for his wife's choice um, of abortion in the context of gestational illness. Xiao Wentai never made an universal claim about reproductive rights. Although she, he vaguely mentioned his sense of guilt, he also didn't explicitly question the role of his sexuality in leading to the many pregnancies that tormented his wife. Furthermore, he carefully left his own agency in procuring the in induced abortion obscure, and he emerged in his own narrative as a rational, um, as a quite rational, okay, here, I'm almost done, as a quite rational, loyal, loving, and the loved husband. But as a personal statement and the historical text, Shao's commemoration was precious and revealing for a few reasons. On the one hand, still allowed us a rare access to a publicized and richly contextualized account of a reproductive crisis um, as a family experienced it. Although the, the account was filtered through the lens of the husband and it is difficult to verify its accuracy, it allowed the, the examination of the gendered participation of the male partner 
in reproductive crisis by detailing on the front, front pages of a major newspaper the actions and the thoughts of a caring and attentive husband who left his public duties to accompany his conjugal partner through her troubled pregnancy and illness. Public publications like the, these normalized a certain masculine model and the husband's place in the sphere of childbirth. Joining the late Ming cult of the sensitive gentleman capable of qing or private authentic feelings, his account further reinforced the role of the husband, educated husband, as a chief mourner and a chronicler of infantile and maternal mortality in the family. Two more minutes. Okay. Yeah. This document becomes even more intriguing if we delve into the, its authorship and think about what the husband may have deliberately as true. The author Xiao Wen Tai was um, was a uh, was actually very famous in China, but not under this name Xiao Wen Tai. He was better known as Xiao Li Zi. That's his pen name. Um, he was born in Shaoxing in um, 1882, and he had a solid classical education and passed the professional examination, civil service examination. And, and he also studied uh, uh, in Shanghai, in Treaty Board Shanghai, therefore exposed to modern Western learning as well. In terms of political activism, he's a busy man, right? He was a member of the Revolutionary Alliance, which was a foreigner of the Nationalist Party, Rule China later on. And then he was also early member of the Chinese Communist Party. And this well, very well connected veteran political activist, activist was also a newspaper man. He's a journalist. He helped to launch and edit several influential newspapers, including this newspaper, the very newspaper, Republican Daily News, where the obituary appeared. In terms of his involvement in women's movement and the birth control movement, he was better known, best known for as one of the first person who endorsed family planning in the 1950s during the communist rule. But in fact, as early as 1922, Republican News's supplement name, uh, named Awakening, which was edited by nobody other than Xiao Li Zi, was already one of the most important platforms that supported discussions about birth control and published the translations of related Euro American, Japanese, uh, feminist, dem um, demographic, eugenic theories in the aftermath of American birth control activist Margaret Sanger's visit to China in 1922. In other words, Xiao Wen Tai definitely put right in the more May Force style argumentative. Okay, I'll come bring this back. This is a more typical May Force style argumentative vernacular prose. Um, and then, um, but he didn't use this one. He could use um, using his, um, he, so he actually published quite a few pieces on Sangerism and birth control using this kind of style and under the name of Xiao Li Zi. And just like many other intellectuals, male intellectuals also did in 1922 and thereafter. But few such writings, this type of writing, um, actually mention any personal involvement in a depth comparable to the obituary Xiao Wen Tai wrote in 1920. And in explaining Xiao Li Zi and others' first control activism, few researchers also have factored in the impact of firsthand experiences and personal crisis, such as Xiao's witnessing of her, his wife's death uh, in, ex in explaining why they were promoting first control movement in China. They didn't talk about those, right? So my purpose of retrieving this episode is not merely to extend, um, you know, history, Xiao Li Zi's activism further back. Rather, I think Xiao Wen Tai's morning testified an important personal link um, that is often overlooked and underestimated in our comprehension of modern China's reforms and revolutions. We still have the tendency to privilege translated texts, editorials, and polemical writings when we trace the burst, bursting excitement of an idea or movement in modern China. And these texts, genres, and the sources tend to again direct our attention to the grand narratives and the neologisms that populated them, as well as the image of the almost always righteous, eloquent, and clear-minded public intellectuals that emerge in these genres. 
Well, messy domestic and reproductive scenes did sometimes appear in such genres and debates. They usually serve as a for a narrower purpose. Oftentimes they were invoked in a way to prove women's ignorance or victimhood to justify the need for enlightenment or action. Such narratives tend to reduce the uh, women to an isolated moment of birth or death who served as a footnote or raw materials for theories, claims, and actions. Um, and the, this kind of genres and the intellectual fashions also, also pushed the, the kinds of voyeuristic, ambivalent, guilt-ridden, and mentally shaken intellectuals, men, uh, or men in general, out of the picture. And therefore, of course, this kind of men continue to exist, but they do risk being drowned out in historical memories of reproduction and the reproductive activism should we not listen more carefully, creatively, creative, creatively uh, and intentionally. We risk overstating the significance of Margaret Sanger, the year 1922, and the Shao Lizi, rather than those like the lone Yangzhou woman, the praying father-in-law, the husband who punched the midwife, um, and the Tu Yiying and the Shao Wentai. In this sense, lending an ear, I argue, to the quieter voices, um, like everything I said today, I argue, can reach our understanding of not only everyday masculinities, but also manifested of reality and the potential of reproductive awakening then and now. Thank you.